Hi everyone, I'm Becky Farrell, Research Lead and Programming Consultant for Dance Data Project. Our series, Moving Forces, Motherhood in Dance, is composed of rapid fire conversations with mothers in varying roles in the dance field. Today, I am so excited to be joined by the fabulous Rachel Rizzuto, choreographer, dancer, writer, teaching assistant professor at the University of Illinois, and new mom. Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. I'm excited to be here. Yay, I'm excited to have you here. Okay, rapid fire. So let's just like jump right in. Um, this first question, I'm excited, right? Uh, at what point in your career did you become a mother? It was so recent. It was so recent. Uh, my daughter Clementine was born on May 12th of this year. So I've been a mom for very short and yet also a very long six months. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And, you know, our birthdays are one day off. I was really hoping she would have oh, that man's birthday, that but that's Taurus. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you your hands full. I already know it. <laughs> <laughs> when you became a mother, you know, as a brand new mom, what barriers are you already seeing? Like, what are some things that you have encountered? Well, I think the biggest one was that when I had Clementine, I was still teaching as a teaching assistant professor at the University of Illinois, but I was technically on a 70% appointment. So mm. I didn't have a, a, a parental leave built into my contract, which is why she was very carefully planned to coincide, you know, fingers crossed her birth with the end of the semester. So I had to essentially forge my own parental leave over the summer. And that was... And it was unavoidable with my current, I'm happy to be in a 100% contract now to be full time and be able to have parental leave eventually if I choose to have another kid. Mm -hmm. But um, that was really tough, you know, organizing, you only have so much control over pregnancy, life in general. So that was really tough. And then, you know, going back to school, even though I had three months, essentially, of being off work, you know, right. you're, you're still working over the summer for preparing for the new semester. And going back when she was three months old was really hard. We hit a sleep regression. We were introducing a nanny to come a few days a week. So it was a lot of change for her and for me and my husband, Danny. Yeah. And all of that sort of jumping right back into a, a full-time position and navigating that transition was really tough. And I would have loved to have more time. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and so thinking about that, were there were there any resources or support systems along the way that were helpful? I know that you had to really like self navigate this this <laughs> motherhood journey. So was there anything that you well, thought that was supportive along the way? Yeah. Well, I think my biggest support system was just the very few friends that my husband and I have who have already had babies. Yeah. Because they are the ones I would turn to when the internet, the middle of the night Google searches were giving me many different answers. Uh, I'm lucky to have really incredible friends who were so generous with their knowledge and their time and just able to generate empathy for me and Danny when things are really tough. And then I'm also so incredibly fortunate to have the support system that I have here at the University of Illinois Dance Department. I mean, from the very beginning, when I first told people I was pregnant through the end of that you know, semester up until Clementine's birth over the summer, when I came back to school, I have been showered with gifts, like physical, tangible presents. People were constantly coming over in the early days to visit, to hold her, to give me and Danny a break, to let us nap. People were dropping off food. And it wasn't just a, a one time, you know, let's see the baby. We'll never see you again. People right. are still coming to our house and mm. offering to help out. And having that support system here and just knowing that everyone understands or at least it seems like they under, hopefully they understand <laughs> when I'm running late, when things yeah. are not going according to plan. That has been so key to having to, to not having a nervous breakdown this semester for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very special community there. It is a really special like, community. Yeah. Incredible. Really I'm really glad that you were able to, to have that support. And it's one of those um, communities where we do see moms, you know. Yes, just, I know. Just, and I have my, the person I share an office with, shout out to Anna Sapochikov. <laughs> yeah. She is able to give me advice, to make me laugh, um, to commiserate with me. It's yeah. been incredible to have another mom just sitting next to me right sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay, thinking about supportive partners in this way, right? So how can we encourage 
like partner support, particularly those who um, self-identify as male in an equal role in parenting, you know? I know yeah. Danny incredible. How is he is incredible? Yeah. Balance is always sort of tricky, right? Because the child is so dependent on the mother, right? So how can we help this balance? Is there a way that that's even possible? You know, I was thinking about I was thinking about this earlier this week and I I am again incredibly fortunate to have a husband Danny who is 50% in with me and he does all of the nighttime feeding. He's he washes bottles. He's cleaning up. He's he does everything that he can to help. But you're right that it's even with a fifty percent investment mm -hmm. in this kid. Uh, by the I mean I chose to chest feed, and I am her main source of nutrition right now. It's just it's a different. We have a different relationship at this point in Clementine's life than she and Danny can have. And there's there's just so much that a partner a supportive partner cannot do. And I was thinking to myself, so what is it that's actually helping me get through these <laughs> really tough times yeah. when I know that I'm the only one that can calm the baby down or right now she's in a super clingy phase where she mm -hmm. literally only wants me to hold her. And I think that this is, this might sound really trite or uh, basic, but I think having a partner who has at least sympathy and potentially even empathy for you in these moments. Mm -hmm. Someone who is going to tell you, I see how hard you're working and I know how, how tough this is yep. and you're doing a great job. I am, my number one love language is words of affirmation. Yes. I take so much from that just in being seen and, and mm -hmm. Danny telling me, you are working hard and you're doing a good job and I know this is tough. I feel mm -hmm. like, okay even though I understand that the majority of some of, you know, elements of the caregiving caregiving fall to me right now, this is, I needed to hear that. And that makes me, it makes me feel better, which allows me to like face the next obstacle that only I can get us past, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's great. That caring, that affirmation, that empathy. I think those are things that are really important because, you know, in many cases, like you said, you, Danny can't feed the baby in that way. And if there are yeah. different stages and different, you know, levels of attachment, um, yeah. there are things that you just do have to work through, but it's, it's really, it's really incredible to have a, a partner that is it able to is. Okay. Yeah. So thinking about dance data project and the work that we do, is there more that we can do to advocate for mothers in the field? I mean, I think this is also potentially going to sound really trite. I think that the, just talking about it, I'm so grateful to the Dance Data Project and to you for, for spearheading this project. And it seems like the more we talk about these things, the more, like you said, people will approach conversations that they might think are difficult. Just getting the, the knowledge out there is such a crucial part, I think, to advancing life for moms. <laughs> it's a Absolutely. terrible phrase but I think you know what I mean it's just yeah. talking about it and letting other people know I mean I was someone who really didn't have a lot of um, interaction or experience with babies yep. or with with new moms for that matter with mm -hmm. new parents and I think that the more information that's out there you know then I wouldn't maybe have felt so completely blindsided by many things if that information had just been a part of my sphere in a bigger way. I mean, it's Absolutely. not it's not obviously all on organizations to make to to feed me information about how to raise a baby. But it would be nice if I'd had like if I'd heard about things, then I could be like, oh yes. right, that that rings a bell. I think that's the the most important thing. Yeah, it's just getting more information out there and continuing to like. Yep. What is it? It's like you have to see or read something eight times before you actually take it in. Some absurd statistic. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, pummel me with information about babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People need that information. And and honestly, like you, you can't be what you can't see. And I, I mean, in most of my degrees and my times in dance studio and for a majority of my career, I did not see yeah. moms in the field. And that is so different. It was so eye opening to me. And I'm like, yeah. how can we support? How can we advocate for these incredible mothers in the field? Um, yeah. So thanks so much, Rachel, for being part oh of gosh, this. Yeah. Thank you so much, Becky, for having me. I was so excited to be a part of this, especially as a new mom. 
Yay! Yeah. I'm yeah, I'm really excited about this project. So yeah. It's great. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone that's watching. We will have more Moving Forces interviews headed your way soon. Thank you. Thank you.